The Konoha 12 arrived back to town. The whole way back, Sasuke was badgering an evasive Kakashi about the red-haired man, but to no avail. The most Kakashi was willing to share was that he was mysterious, which of course frustrates Sasuke. As with the end of their past missions, they gather at the Hokage building, but they're not brought before Minato for another debriefing. Because of the reignition of war, the Jonin have all been called in for a special meeting. The village's Anbu continues to guard, and the Chunin and Genin are all placed on call. Not really given any additional information, the Genin wander aimlessly outside the Hokage's building. Sakura is unsure of where to go, as she wanted a new instrument from Kurunai, who immediately vanished with the rest of the Jonin. She knows Kurunai lives on the same street as the Hokage, and decides to maybe hang around outside her building. She's found something she's good at, so she doesn't want to slack in her training with it. Shino brings Choji home, who has mostly recovered, but will likely need a few days before he's returned to focus. Ino and Shikamaru follow after Shino, concerned for their fellow childhood friend. Tenten fidgets uneasily, indecisive between two destinations. Home and... hmm... Finally alone, and with spare time, Hinata corners Neji and demands to know why he didn't tell her of Hanabi's kidnapping. Avoiding eye contact, Neji tells her that it was an Anbu-ranked mission. He didn't think he was free to discuss its contents. Hinata wants to press him because that's not enough to hide info about her only sister, and her little sister at that, but that he gave her any answer relaxes her enough to forgive and forget. Hinata's just a little too nice and soft. Disappointed that they didn't get any real action, Rock Lee invites Kiba to his training spot where they can spar if he wants. Naruto knows his dad's going to be busy for a while, and the Sanin are likely still at the border cleaning things up, so he opts to go home. Waving his goodbyes to Shikamaru and offering a silent nod to Neji, Sasuke leaves the pack to head home. Perhaps it's because they were separated on the mission, but Sasuke didn't get the same animosity this time from Neji as he had had before. He seemed awfully focused. Sasuke forgets about Neji pretty fast though. Now that the mission's over, he's able to freely think about the red-haired man and how he got his hands on a Sharingan. There are very few known people who have laid hands on a Sharingan. Most of them are dead. The rest were being actively hunted when found. Sasuke made sure to engrave everything about the red-haired man to memory. Best and worst case scenario was that this was the man who orchestrated the massacre of his clan. He made Asuma and Kakashi working together look like children in their fight. It took all three Sanin just to scare him away. But he seemingly used every element, had knowledge of a very particular style of taijutsu, and utilized it without a Byakugan. All the pieces fit for Sasuke that this man could very well be the one who killed his family. His pace quickens, and he gets home with a ferocity he means to share with his clan. In the main common area of his neighborhood, he overhears a public forum held by the current leaders of the clan. The Uchiha neighborhood is fairly removed from the rest of town, but not so much that they can hold their meetings so loudly and outside. Sasuke stops, hidden by a wall, and wonders if they'll reveal anything that they otherwise wouldn't with him present. A push from behind by his cousin, Akane squanders his attempts to stay hidden. Just an aside, Akane is a made-up character, because we don't really have very many known canonical Uchiha that I can use here. Akane is a Chunin and about three years older than Sasuke. Before Sasuke and after Itachi, Akane was considered the resident prodigy. So he takes time when he can to thwart Sasuke, robbed of his inherent potential by the newer model. They cheer Sasuke's arrival, and he sees several Jonin amongst them, Jonin who've clearly refused to attend the Hokage's meeting. Dread creeps into Sasuke, that their plans may have advanced to such level that they're openly denying the Hokage. He maintains his neutral expression as he sits amongst his clanmates. One of the Uchiha from the small crowd shouts that it's time to quote-unquote upset the balance. Sasuke believes in the power of Minato, and unfortunately the power of the Uchiha clan has diminished drastically since the massacre. In the worst case for Sasuke, his clanmates actually delude themselves into thinking they can beat Minato, and then he'd definitely be alone in the world. 
he wouldn't be able to fault Minato for defending himself, just as much as he doesn't want his clanmates to do something that all would regret. With the war in full swing again, Moruchiha might die simply from those consequences. As it is, there are only 23 still living members, and only half of that number are able-bodied ninja. Another Uchiha stands and shouts that they need a new Hokage. Sasuke's walked in on one of the most unstable meetings he's ever seen. To shout for usurpation while outside just consumes Sasuke with fear for what may come. A few aunts and uncles beside him whisper to each other that before long, they'll have an Uchiha as Hokage and finally get what Madara was after. His anxiety of the red-haired man is now but a shadow of a thought. Someone else in the group declares that no more will the Hyuga stand over them. Another angrily demands that once power has been taken, they remove the Hyuga permanently. For that matter, another says, they might as well remove the Nara clan as well. Those blasted Senju sympathizers have destroyed what could have been a glorious village. Jabbed from behind, Sasuke angrily turns to see Akane grinning at him. Akane asks him if he's excited for the Uchiha banner to unfurl on the walls of the Hokage building. Playing at being brainwashed, Sasuke shifts his anger to a quiet chuckle as he readily agrees with him. Akane continues that all they'll need to do after taking power back is to rebuild their clan, remarking that Sasuke's age group has a few cute girls. Sasuke inwardly turns to fury as his elders speak of a complete corruption of all the strong values the fourth tries to build. His Uchiha brethren are willing to commit every crime imaginable just to grasp absolute power. Akane is barely older than he is, and already his outlook is seemingly sick and irredeemable. He can't even use the excuse of a mission anymore to duck out of the meeting, and has to sit through it all. Finally, though still rambunctious, the Uchiha elders call an end to the meeting. Without sharing any words with his family, Sasuke ducks away, making sure that no one cares to look where he's going or call out to him. As soon as he leaves their neighborhood, Sasuke makes a mad dash for the training grounds. He's terrified that someone might follow him, so he intends to take a very loopy path to the Hokage's house. Every time he turns a corner or exits shadows, he glances around at windows and rooftops or to the tops of poles or in trees for any sneaky follower. Moving around the edges of the training grounds, he moves towards the Hokage faces and finds relief in the shade of the forest. Emerging from the other side and right under the faces, he looks up and sees someone in a black cloak standing atop a tall post. They don't seem to be focused on him at all, and Sasuke instinctively looks behind him before glancing back at the figure, but they're gone. Paranoia gripping him, Sasuke sprints full on until he turns onto the final road. The road's not busy, but there are several people walking along the road both ways. Standing in front of him is Akane, with his classic green Chunin garb, who had clearly been successfully following him. He points out to Sasuke that they're on the street that leads to the Hokage's house, and wonders why Sasuke's found himself here of all places. Sasuke tells him that he was just going for a run, since their mission that day wasn't overly tiring. This is partly true. After camping at the outpost, they headed back home early that morning. Akane tells him that the oh-so-great genius doesn't need to exercise. Taking a step closer, Akane leans towards Sasuke and asks him again if he was headed to the Hokage's house. Seeing a flash of pink behind Akane, Sasuke suddenly blurts out that he was going to see that girl. Pushing Akane out of the way, Sasuke runs up to Sakura, and before she has a chance to even say hello, he turns her away from Akane and gets her to walk with him. Sakura wonders what he's doing, and he turns down an alley with her to escape Akane's sight. As soon as they're behind the wall, Sasuke releases her and hugs against the wall to peek if Akane is still watching. Irked, Sakura begins berating him for pulling her away from Kurunai's house, but he completely ignores her. When she tries to re-enter the street, he pushes her back and tells her to stay still, but she demands an explanation. He looks at her, weary, and tells her she's annoying. Akane is not in sight. Sasuke relaxes a little bit, aware that the Hokage's house is now literally in sight. Without sharing another word to Sakura, he dashes across the street and into the trees. She realizes that maybe her teammates aren't the worst ones she could have. 
Even Naruto, the unpopular Ninetales kid, talks to her, but what she just experienced with Sasuke was confusing at its very best. Sneaking around back, Sasuke enters through the back door. Normally, he respectfully knocks, but given everything he now knows, it is imperative that the Hokage learns everything. He walks into Naruto, popping a cup of ramen open, and asks where his dad is. Naruto rolls his eyes and mutters, some genius, to himself, before telling Sasuke that his dad's going to be at work probably for the next few days. Growling in frustration, Sasuke throws the cup of ramen out of Naruto's hands and tells him to use the flying Raijin to summon his dad. Naruto looks at his spilled ramen and up at Sasuke with a different level of annoyance. He tells Sasuke that he'd get in major trouble if he interrupted his dad now of all times. Sasuke tells him that if it's about the fourth's life, surely that's serious enough, right? Naruto dismisses it as a lark. His dad's stronger than anyone. He even says in a flat tone that there probably won't be another Hokage until his dad dies of old age because he's just too strong. Half the kids in the academy said they wanted to be Hokage, but what a stupid goal when his dad would hold the title until they're all old. Sasuke's filled with anger and fear and frustration and can barely stand to have a stupid argument with Naruto. Sasuke tells him that it doesn't matter whether you're a Hokage or a Genin as long as everyone's fighting for the same cause and but Naruto cuts him off telling Sasuke that he's overheard some of the conversations Sasuke's had with his dad. Saving him from some attempted overthrow won't give Sasuke any easy promotions. He's even shocked that Sasuke is so willing to sacrifice his entire family for some guy that might not even be fighting for his cause. What does that mean? Sasuke asks him, and Naruto willfully tells him that his dad probably isn't devoting that much time to finding out who caused the massacre. The front door opens just as Sasuke grabs Naruto by the collar and Jiraiya walks in. Excited by the entrance of a Sanin, Sasuke throws Naruto to the floor and runs to greet Lord Jiraiya. He tells him that Minato's life could be in danger but he has no idea how to contact him. Naruto clambers to his feet and repeats that no amount of effort will let him get to Chunin faster. He repeatedly tells Naruto to shut up and grips Jiraiya by his red vest in desperation, asking again how he can speak to Minato. Sasuke just starts rambling about the meeting, but it's disjointed and Jiraiya doesn't quite pick up on all the details. Sasuke switches to talking about the man in the cloak on the post, and then the red-haired man and then his Sharingan. Eventually, Jiraiya tells him to sit down and asks Naruto to get some water for their guest. He tells Sasuke that Minato is currently in a room full of loyal Jonin. Nobody could ever touch him at the moment. Realizing the logic, Sasuke sits down and tries to calm his breathing. Naruto hasn't gotten him any water, because of course he hasn't. Instead, he's staring daggers at him for ruining his supper. Naruto asks him again why he wants Chunin so badly, and Sasuke says he never mentioned Chunin or promotion at any point. Jiraiya asks them what they were talking about when he came in. After the explanation, Jiraiya looks at Naruto curiously and asks him directly if he wants to be Hokage. Shaking his head, Naruto stubbornly tells them it's a waste of energy. There can only be one Hokage and his dad's still young. He'll have it for another 50 years, so what's the point? Jiraiya tells Naruto that when Minato was first chosen, it was because the third Hokage wanted to retire, and thought the transition of power would be easier if there were two Hokage for a time. Not to mention that had the third found a capable ninja earlier in life, he would have stepped down even earlier. The title doesn't just change when a Kage dies, they can also just pass it off. Naruto still insists it's a waste of effort. If most of the ninja in the village want a title that only one of them will get, then you'll end up with a village full of disappointed people. Jiraiya tells him that he's missing the point, and Sasuke nods along with Jiraiya. Feeling ganged up on, Naruto is now the one to resort to violence. Sasuke watches him come and rises to the occasion as both lock grips on each other. Jiraiya sighs and just as he's about to stand up to quell their squabble, Minato reaches down and grabs his son by the wrist. Wordlessly, Naruto releases Sasuke. Jiraiya chuckles and tells Minato he's just as fast as always. He didn't even blink and Minato was just there suddenly. 
Minamu tells them that he's taking a little break after the meeting, but he doesn't have much time for freedom right now. Sasuke tells him that he simply must speak to him. It's a life or death situation, which again causes Naruto to roll his eyes. Minato gets Jiraiya to close the curtains as there are unwanted eyes spying on the house. He tells Sasuke that he was tailed. Akane is across the street. No idea how he'll leave the house now, Sasuke apologizes for being sloppy. Minato dismisses the apology as Akane is a promising young ninja in his own right. Sitting down and even inviting Naruto to sit in, Minato asks Sasuke to speak quickly because he truly doesn't have very much time. So Sasuke splurges on the Uchiha meeting and the red-haired man possibly being the culprit behind the massacre. Their last meeting was only a few weeks ago, and the meeting held then by the Uchiha concerned spying on Minato. To elevate so quickly could be connected to the sudden reignition of war. On the other hand, Minato wonders if it's just a good chance to take advantage of the chaos. Considering the red-haired man, Minato still doesn't know very much about him but that he had a Sharingan and could use Gentle Fist. It's a dangerous concoction, a combination of techniques from the Uchiha and Hyuga. Not only would that make for a scary foe, but it could foment further distrust between the two houses. He tells everyone in the room to keep information about the red-haired man to themselves. News of the man will soon reach the village, but if they can slow the dissemination of information, they can stay in control of it. Sighing about his time being up, Minato tells Sasuke that he'll take care of Akane for him. Lying prone atop a roof opposite their home, Akane is staying well enough hidden for most to miss him. But you can imagine his shock when Minato suddenly addresses him from behind, wondering why he's so nervous about knocking on his door. Panicking about being caught, Akane stutters and just runs away. Minato smiles sadly that the Uchiha clan just can't seem to find happiness and peace. His smile turns to a frown, and he vanishes again to return to work. We're going back in time a little bit to when the Jonin were all summoned for a special meeting with Minato. New Jonin are excited for this meeting, but the veterans already know it's coming. They've gathered in a great big hall so that Minato can share his long-term plans for this never-ending war. He starts the meeting with a little speech about how the first Hokage, Hashirama, fought specifically to end sending children to battle. And though they've taken strides to slow the promotion process of young ninja, there are still leaps and bounds from the future Hashirama wanted. But they will do what they can, so Minato assigns the Jonin as the invasion force. They will be the frontline soldiers who cross over into the Land of Stone to take out outposts and occupy villages. The Chunin of the village are responsible for fortifying these newly taken positions. They will only take an offensive role if the leading Jonin or the Hokage himself directs them to. Genin are not allowed to leave the country's borders, and so will be put on defensive jobs only. Historically, the Land of Fire has had a superior fighting force to the Land of Earth. But in his efforts to pursue peace, Minato tried the defensive path, and clearly that hasn't worked. So, he is sending Orochimaru as the general of the offensive forces. Orochimaru is short-tempered, but is quite possibly the second strongest ninja in the village. He has decades of experience with this war and has intimate knowledge of how to traverse the land of Earth. Lady Tsunade will augment the Chunin forces so that any retreating Jonin who are injured can have the best medical assistance possible. In this way, if the offensive ninja need urgent help, a second Sanin will be relatively nearby. Lord Jiraiya will remain in the Land of Fire and captain the Anbu when the Hokage cannot. As they've had a recent graduating class of Genin, Minato has also chosen to move the Chunin exams up. Before their official offensive begins, every ninja that isn't in the Border Guard will be in the village to protect it while the Chunin exams take place. With so many additional ninja within the village, Minato has also invited teams from the Land of Wind and the Land of Lightning to take part in the exams. Also, to a lesser degree, minor nations that haven't taken a side will also be offered invitations. These are the lands of grass, rain, and waterfalls. These are the three nations sandwiched between the land of fire and the land of earth that have chosen to stay out of it. Minato hopes to curry at least some favor along with a promise that he won't attack them in any way. 
Hopefully, some promising new Genin will earn the Chunin promotion so that they can help in the war efforts more directly. He also makes clear that he doesn't want to take over the Land of Earth. All he wants to do is push them until they surrender, and then pull all Leaf Ninja out and give them their land back. He hopes to strong-arm them into submission, and then leave them to lick their wounds in peace. Now, let's return to the present. After all his meetings and preparations, Minato finally has time for a different purpose. He and Jiraiya have taken Naruto to the edge of the village for two purposes. The first, he has to augment the seal on the fox's prison. With nothing but violence on the horizon, he needs to make sure that the fox doesn't cause problems. While he reweaves the seal, Jiraiya will be in charge of keeping Naruto subdued. There will be just a moment that the seal weakens substantially before locking up much stronger than before. The day will come that Naruto will learn to conquer the fox and wield its power, but they can't afford to train him in this way quite yet. While Jiraiya works on the seal, Minato is speaking with Anbu to make sure the perimeter is absolutely secure. He turns and tells Naruto that Jiraiya revealed his thoughts about the Hokage position. Naruto eyes Jiraiya for a second before trying to evade the questions. Minato tells him that he doesn't care whether Naruto wants to be a Hokage or quit being a ninja to cook ramen for the rest of his days. For Minato, he just wants Naruto to love what he's doing. Naruto is kind of surprised by the offer but returns to reality fast and says even that can't really happen. When Minato asks why, Naruto tells him that nobody likes him, and even if he plays nice, everyone just assumes he's trying to trick them. An eyebrow raised, Minato asks what Naruto means. Why wouldn't everyone like him? Annoyed now, Naruto tells him because of the monster in his stomach. Why else? Minato tries to reassure him that this isn't a handicap that makes people dislike him. He's a hero for being a prison for that monster, the world's greatest warden. Naruto rolls his eyes and says, it's great that his dad thinks he's a hero, but everyone else just sees him as a monster waiting to break free. Shaking his head, Minato says that's not true. Everyone who's older than Naruto remembers when the fox attacked the village. There's no way they'd think of Naruto that way. Naruto's getting agitated that his dad seems so blind to the insults that he's had to endure. He tells him that the older generation looks at him as the monster that killed the third, and their children just think of him as the monster. It's a no-win scenario. Concerned, Minato asks Naruto how serious he is about these allegations. Naruto swears on his life that no one likes him, except maybe Hinata and Asuma Sensei. Kakashi might be okay too, it's hard to tell what he's thinking with that mask on all the time. Minato uses that and asks Naruto if Asuma likes him despite the fox killing his father, then no one else has any reason to dislike him. But Naruto shrugs. He knows what he sees and hears on a daily basis. Minato then asks him if everyone liked him and everything was perfect in the world, what would he dream for? Naruto just wants to be the strongest. If he's stronger than the monster inside of him, then no one would have any need to fear him and he could instead protect others. Sighing, Minato nods at his son quietly. Jiraiya tells him the seal is prepared, and so Minato goes to double-check the work. He had actually sent a summons for the Uzumaki tribe to make a stop in the village so that they could apply the seal, but that was a month ago now, and he's heard no word back. Before things get really busy for the leaf, he can't wait any longer, and Jiraiya is the resident expert on seals in the village. Kushina taught Minato a lot about seals, but Jiraiya is extremely well-traveled and much more experienced. Their combined efforts would definitely improve the seal's strength. Minato creates a barrier around the area as one of their precautions. Using several jutsu, Jiraiya restrains Naruto, of course warning him ahead of time that this is for everyone's protection. But Naruto sort of knows the song and dance. When he was younger, some old Uzumaki man added modifications to his seal and he was restrained in the same way. I sort of imagine this ritual like how Kakashi applied the seal to Sasuke's curse mark, where there are glyphs drawn across the floor in different directions. That was a really cool visual way to exhibit a pseudo-mystic-like technique, almost like a ritual rather than a jutsu. The chakra cloak covers Naruto as the ritual begins, but the restraints do a good job of keeping Naruto from moving. Jiraiya is standing prepared for any abnormal behavior, but they've prepared well for this. The seal realigns and sets into place, and the chakra cloak dissolves. 
Taking some relieved breaths, they release a now exhausted Naruto from his restraints. After letting him rest for a few minutes, Minato asks if Naruto still wants to learn his new technique. Though tired, Naruto perks up and gets to his feet. Pulling one of his special kunai out, Minato gives it to Naruto. What's different about this kunai is it has no glyphs on its handle, making it inert and unusable for the flying Raijin. He tells Naruto that up until now, he's been using Minato's kunai to get around, which requires the use of hand seals. Because they're father and son, their chakra is very similar and doesn't outright reject each other. Until that seal was strengthened, he didn't want Naruto's kunai tailored for him if the fox's chakra could mix in and potentially corrupt the jutsu. Now, if Naruto channels some of his chakra into the blade, glyphs will appear on its handle that are a unique marker to him. And so, like Minato, Naruto will be able to use the flying Raijin without the use of hand seals. It takes some getting used to, but as long as Naruto remembers the feeling of his chakra link with the blade, he can transfer to it instantly. Naruto's pretty happy to the upgrade of the flying Raijin, but he also reminds his dad that he was promised a new jutsu. His dad laughs and scratches his head. He thought that would be enough of a gift for Naruto. Luckily, Minato has a big bag of tricks. He hoped that through his training sessions with Naruto, his son would pick up on various tricks he could employ with the Flying Raijin. However, with this concerning revelation that Naruto doesn't want to try because everyone hates him, Minato needs to find the root of that problem first. Instead, he squats to the ground and plucks out a big handful of grass. He motions for Naruto to watch as he throws the grass into the air and slowly swipes his hand through the blades of grass and slices them to pieces. Eyes lighting up, Naruto asks him what he just did. He explains that both of them have affinity for wind style, which is a rare gift. It would be a hard jutsu to learn, but what he just showed is called the wind blade jutsu. This technique comes in three forms. You can create little sickles of wind that you can throw with shuriken, or form a sheath along your arm as Minato just did that can cut without being seen. Finally, when you get good enough, you can use the technique to form an invisible sword that can stop solid objects like other weapons. Just as it is a complex technique, it's also very powerful. Techniques like this outsmart the Sharingan but are clear as day for the Byakugan, so Naruto needs to be cautious with who he tries to use it against. The easiest version of this technique to learn is the arm sheath, as it's closest to the body and needs the least amount of manipulation. After showing Naruto the basics of the technique's execution, he insists that all it takes is practice and Naruto will eventually master it. Stay vigilant and keep training, and it'll all pay off. An Anbu hidden in the trees to the right flashes light from a mirror to get Minato's attention before communicating with a few gestures. Minato apologizes to Naruto and Jiraiya, but there's some pressing business he needs to attend to. After Jiraiya agrees to stay and train Naruto, Minato teleports to his office. Standing in the middle of the room is a man in a black cloak that shadows his face. Minato asks him who he is, but the man declines to answer. He tells Minato in a rough voice that just doesn't feel natural that he needs to put an end to this war fast. The fourth asks the man if he's a leaf shinobi, but that question's ignored too. Minato notices the man's shadow seems to splay out in several directions. It could be a genjutsu placed before him, or a mysterious clone jutsu he hasn't seen before. But one thing's for certain, whoever this is, they're not in the room with him. Minato tells the man to state his purpose, and the man repeats that the war needs to end. If he uses the flying raijin, and it's a genjutsu, it'll simply dispel and he'll gain no further information. If he uses his own genjutsu, and it's a genjutsu, he won't have any effect. If it's a clone, nothing short of a shadow clone could deliver this message and have the information gained relayed back to the user. He asks the man why the war needs to end fast. The man tells him that Minato's enemies are increasing fast, and he's running out of protection. Grimacing, Minato wonders if he's an Uchiha trying to taunt him, but he can sense the Uchiha in their neighborhood and just one nearby, one of his Anbu. In fact, outside the normal occupants of the Hokage building, he can't sense anyone out of the ordinary. The man's real body must be outside, hiding nearby or possibly in plain sight in the streets below. He could be employing some sort of suppression that masks him from Minato's sensory ability. 
If he were in Sage mode, the augmentation to his sensory ability would certainly expose the culprit, but it would also require him sitting still for two or three minutes. Were this man skilled enough to infiltrate his very office, he'd certainly become suspicious if Minato just suddenly stopped moving and speaking for a time. Minato relaxes and leans against his desk, shrugging at the man. He asks him what new enemies does he have now. The man tells him a revolt from within is fomenting, and he won't be able to stop them once they gain momentum. Minato doesn't react to the man's words, asking his questions as more to buy time so he can locate the culprit's whereabouts. However, he's making no headway. He currently has just one bodyguard at his office witnessing the exchange. His regular Anbu were still on their way back from the sealing ritual with Naruto. Minato grits his teeth at the realization that this man could be who released the Nine Tails, as he remembers the last time someone took advantage of thinned guards was when Naruto was born. He's about the same height as the other man, and both kept their face hidden. If he shows aggression, he might be able to force the man to retreat, and any rushed retreat would definitely stick out obviously via Minato's sensory ability. He asks the man what he's after. The man turns his head up just enough that his smiling mouth becomes visible. He brings a hand up to his cloaked face, and as he lifts the hood to reveal the rest of his face, he goes up in a poof of smoke. Calling for Raido, Minato tells him to seek far and wide for the man who was just in his room, and Raido appears and disappears without a word of protest. We zero in on Tenten tugging Hinata to follow her down the street. Tenten is high energy and excited as she pulls a bewildered Hinata along with her. Hinata keeps asking Tenten why she's so excited, but Tenten refuses to tell her as she happily runs ahead to the Uzumaki household. Blushing, Hinata asks why they're bugging Naruto too, but Tenten ignores her in her whimsy as she hops up the steps and knocks on the door. Naruto answers the door with a raised eyebrow, wondering why his teammates have come to see him. Hinata stumbles over her words and is muted by Tenten's energy as the latter invites Naruto to come to the training grounds. Naruto shakes his head. He's not interested in that. In reality, he hasn't been able to get the Windblade Jutsu to form properly around his arm yet, and the challenge is hurting his confidence. Tenten's crestfallen for all of two seconds before inviting him to come along anyway to at least watch. Rolling his eyes and glancing at Hinata, Naruto says he needs some fresh air anyway and leaves to get dressed. As they walk through town toward the training grounds, Tenten's so amped up that she's practically vibrating and refuses to tell Hinata and Naruto why. She asks Hinata if she wants to use weapons or just hand to hand or maybe some ninjutsu thrown in for practice. Oh, but it doesn't matter anyway. While engaging in Tenten's crazy small talk, they come across Sakura and Ino who are sitting on a bench and chatting. Without giving a second to breathe, Tenten invites Sakura and Ino to also come train, assuming they've got nothing else to do. Ino sighs that she's been doing so much training lately, she just wants to have some time off. Tenten insists that there won't be any teachers this time, so she can just watch them if she wants. Shrugging, Ino agrees to then go along. Sakura agrees to take part in the training, asking Tenten, why she wanted Naruto along. Without him, it would just be the girls and sounds kind of fun to Sakura. Not to mention, it's Naruto. Of all the boys to pick, why him? Tenten laughs and calls Sakura weird. Naruto's her teammate, why wouldn't she invite him? Naruto smiles at Tenten's optimism but bows his head quickly when Sakura looks at him with a look of quiet disgust. Nonetheless, as the group continues along the road, the girls find themselves distinctly separated from Naruto. Shopkeepers and random passers-by insult him or murmur dark words as he passes. Even Hinata is out of earshot of those cold mutterings, leaving Naruto in an empty silence behind the girls. It's something he's used to, but traveling with a group he thought he would at least pass by unnoticed. As they walk over a small bridge, Naruto hears Jiraiya's voice and peers over the edge. Below, on a dirt path, he sees Jiraiya talking to Sasuke and crooks his head as if it would help him hear better. But there's just enough white noise in the street he's on that all he can make out is their tones of voice, not what they're saying. Naruto finds himself annoyed that the two seem to be having some secret meeting. Lowering to one knee, Jiraiya holds out a hand and Sasuke leans in slightly closer when out of nowhere, a Rasengan forms in Jiraiya's hand. 
instantly, Naruto feels shock and betrayal that Jiraiya would show his dad's personal invention to someone like Sasuke. His hands clench into fists until his knuckles turn white. Relinquishing the Rasengan a few moments later, Jiraiya holds up three fingers and starts explaining something to Sasuke. The worst part of this is Naruto knows he can't stop what's being said. If he makes a big stink out of it, he'll be called out for overreacting. It's not like his dad created it to stay in the family, but still. An arm wraps around Naruto's neck as Ten Ten bonks into him and laughs that he's falling behind. Pocketing the moment for something he plans on bringing up later, Naruto reluctantly pulls away from the bridge and continues following the girls. The Rasengan is so much cooler than the Windblade. Why was Sasuke getting special treatment? It should at least be taught to Naruto first, not some random Uchiha. Looking at his feet in frustration, Naruto walks headlong into Shino. Shino doesn't have much to say about it, other than Naruto should probably look in the direction he's walking. But Tenten carries enough energy to cover for Naruto's soured attitude, and asks Shino to come with them to the training grounds. She doesn't even wait for a reply before pulling him to follow. As they finally get to the edge of the village proper, they see a newly built wall that seems to block their path. They look up and down the street, but there's nobody around to explain it. However, this new wall's blocking the training grounds. Sakura notes that it was someone's jutsu. Maybe someone else is in the training grounds trying to train in private. Tenten starts scaling the wall, claiming that the training grounds more than big enough for two groups to train. Of course, they're now all able to climb this wall with their feet, so that part's pretty easy. We zoom out and we see Choji and Shikamaru on their favorite rooftop bench, looking at the clouds overhead. Choji's outwardly fine now, but Shikamaru and their families combined are concerned for his well-being all the same. So Shikamaru's assigned himself as Choji's buddy for the last couple days to make sure he's fine. Sitting up, Shikamaru stretches and looks down at the street below spotting his fellow Genin a few blocks away scaling the wall. He pulls Choji's attention to it, who seems uninterested. Shikamaru notes that he walked past that wall earlier and there was a do not enter sign on it. He wonders why so many Genin would so willingly break the rules, leaning forward and squinting at the wall. He tells Choji that the sign is gone, but when he looks over, Choji has withdrawn. Choji tells him they shouldn't worry about it and they should just talk about something else. Shikamaru reassures Choji that some low-level rule-breaking is all an expectation for kids their age. But Choji says that he's bored of sitting outside and asks Shikamaru to go get snacks with him. Sighing, Shikamaru improvises and tells Choji to go tell his dad about the Genin over the wall, while Shikamaru will go tell them directly. They'll meet back at the rooftop and snack to their heart's content afterward. Finally, in a break in the trees, Tenten turns to the group and her eyes are like stars as she pulls out a scroll and lays it on the ground. She tells them that it only took asking and a bit of deliberation for her to get this gift. Minato first asked his Ambu if they were interested, but after they all passed and the Jonin were asked instead, Tenten was put on the waiting list. A couple of Jonin showed initial interest, but after some testing, decided it wasn't right for them. Smacking the scroll, Tenten initiates the summon, and two swords appear on the scroll. Hinata, Sakura, Shino, and Naruto perk up, realizing what they're looking at. She tells them that they're lucky that Ringo was so short, because her swords are a perfect size for Tenten. She spins them with delight, showing off some flourishes. Most of the Jonin and all of the Anbu thought the swords were too small for them. On someone of Ringo's stature, they looked normal sized, but in the hands of a man a whole head taller, they were uncomfortably small. Just through sheer size alone, Tenten was given the fast track to getting them. Not to mention Lord Forth told her that she was instrumental in defeating Ringo, so he was glad that she ended up inheriting them. She asks again if anyone wants to spar, and now everyone ducks out, leaving her shocked. She stops them from leaving and told them that they agreed to come. It's too late now, they can't leave. Eno then steps up and agrees to spar with her, but asks her to take it easy since swords are a little bit better than kunai. Naruto thinks to himself that he could fight her properly if he had better hold on the wind blade jutsu. He separates himself from the group and looks at his arm. His dad told him to use hand seals at first to more easily wield the wind element. Once he got a hang of it, all he'd have to do is conjure the wind element and then shape and manipulate it to his liking. 
Sheena looks up at the higher branches of the trees, realizing that the blue sky is slowly vanishing in place of a light fog. It's midday. He wonders why fog is falling now. He doesn't alert the others to it, though, since they're all still inside the safety of the village. Pairing off with Sakura, he agrees to train with her. Between the sensory aspect of his bugs and her genjutsu, he surmises that they're perfect sparring partners, forcing one another to get better. Hinata hides behind a nearby tree to watch Naruto train, though she can't tell what he's doing as he's just staring at his forearm. Naruto bends down and grabs a fistful of grass. He thinks he might be doing it without realizing it, but waving his hand through the falling grass yields no results. Looking up, he realizes he's a fair distance from the others as a light haze has fallen, and they sound far away. A twig breaking alerts him to Hinata's presence, and he asks her if the others are wandering away. She leaves cover to approach him, not sure exactly what he said. When she asks him to repeat himself, he yells, what? But it's not overly loud. She tries to raise her voice, but finds difficulty, and looks to the others to see if they're experiencing the same effects. Without realizing it, the fog's gotten so thick that she can't see the other Genin besides Naruto. She grabs Naruto's arm and tries to shout, but even sounds quiet to her own ears. Is the fog taking their sight and their hearing, or are there other tricks at play here? She yells to him again that they need to search for the others. She says the group must be in that direction because the tree she was hiding behind is not there anymore. Worried that she's lost her bearings, Hinata activates her Byakugan. Squinting and cringing, Hinata only sees a super massive light of chakra around her. Even Naruto right beside her vanishes in place of this teal colored chakra. Deactivating her Byakugan, she tells Naruto that it's not again Jutsu. This fog is a ninjutsu, and it's blinding her Byakugan. She remarks that if she were Neji, she'd be able to see past it, but Naruto can't hear her. Anything short of screaming, and they can't hear each other. Tenten knocks one of Ino's kunai out of her hand, and Ino laughs uncertainly, telling Tenten that she just can't keep up like this. This gives Ino pause, as she realizes her own voice is muffling. She picks up the kunai and turns around, but Tenten is no longer in sight. Startled, she wonders when a fog dropped in and quickly runs to where Tenten was, but she finds nothing. Spinning in place, Ino panics and kneels down where she is. She tries a small surge of chakra to dispel the genjutsu, but nothing happens. Because it's not genjutsu. Nearby, Ino hears muffled yelling and she crawls toward it until a foot steps on her hand and she yelps in muted pain. Kneeling, Shikamaru greets her and she relaxes slightly relieved that someone saw them enter the forest. Otherwise, they all would have been stuck there for who knows how long. Unfortunately for her, Shikamaru did not bring backup, but Choji's going to pull through for them. Ten Ten runs into a disoriented Shino, who warns her that the fog is, like, slowly turning into smoke or something, and his bugs are repulsed. She tells him to keep an arm on her shoulders, and she will guide him to the exit. Easier said than done, she can't see a thing past the length of her own arms. Hiding in the branches of a tree, Sakura is alone and protected only by her genjutsu. She can't even see the ground below and starts feeling an uncanny vertigo the more she tries to look out at the wall of fog surrounding her. Naruto yelps and releases Hinata from his arm as his other arm is struck by something sharp. However, considering they're in the middle of nowhere, he has no idea who could have cut him. Another cut slides across the top of his shoulder and another in his leg. Swinging at the air around him, Naruto freaks out at the hidden attacker. The cuts are shallow and superficial, but an unseen offender is what throws Naruto off the most. Another cut on his forearm, and Naruto decides, Nah, this isn't me, and yeets his Raijin kunai into the sky. He takes another couple swings at the air before teleporting to his kunai, which is on the way down, and he collides with Sakura, knocking her out of her tree. As both tumble to the ground, Sakura recovers first and decks Naruto for being such a klutz. Forced alone by Naruto's flight, Hinata runs until she hits trees and hides behind one. She can only wait for help now, disappointed that Naruto would so easily abandon her. Sasuke is stopped at the wall, wanting to practice what Jiraiya just taught him. He too sees no sign and just scales the wall. He notes the heavy fog from atop the wall, but jumps in with no concern. Far above on another rooftop, an Anbu looks down at the wall, having witnessed Sasuke voluntarily jumping into the fog. 
In the next instant, the Anbu is gone. Afraid of more cuts, Naruto tries to run away again, but Sakura angrily holds onto his collar and tells him he better not abandon her now that he's ruined her cover. She asks him how he saw through her genjutsu, but he tells her he was falling. The last thing on his mind was spotting genjutsu. She tells him that they need to stay put and wait for a Joni to come get them because there's no way they were finding their way alone. Naruto stares at her and then shakes his head in disagreement. He figures they need to run until they hit a wall and then just follow the wall. Or maybe they can jump high enough to clear the fog. If one of them transforms into a hamster and the other one throws them, surely they could get out of the fog. Sakura tells him, good idea, before smacking him again, wondering if he paid attention to it any of their classes in the academy. If a ninja could transform into a mouse, then wouldn't everyone be able to easily infiltrate? The resulting transformation has to be close in size to the user. Naruto scratches his head and tells her that she's not coming up with any good ideas either. Sasuke immediately regrets jumping into the fog, but as he lands and turns to go back, the wall is nowhere to be found. It's as if he's just entered into an infinite forest. But he remains vigilant and keeps right on running until he eventually bumps into Hinata. She grabs his arm and yells that sight and sound are useless here. He tells her to keep up as she tells him how many of them came out here. She also tells him not to run off on his own as they would lose each other just as quickly as they found each other. Pulling wire from his pack, he ties a loop around Hinata's waist, leaves about 6 feet of slack, and then ties a loop around his own waist. He tells her that it'll be uncomfortable, but at least this way no one's getting lost again. Sasuke realizes as he guides Hinata that he doesn't feel the same repulsion with Hinata that he does with Neji. It still strikes him odd that he's guiding her. He's still uncomfortable. Naruto's attacked again by some invisible force that feels like he's being targeted for way more cuts than anyone else. He tries to dodge the invisible enemy and Sakura retreats with him, watching cuts appear from nothingness across Naruto's body. The two run until they are stopped in their tracks by a blood-curdling, deep, guttural roar that pierces the fog easily and begins to dispel it. The invisible force that was hidden by the fog suddenly becomes visible and attempts to flee to more cover. Before he enters the wall of fog again, a supermassive spiked object falls from the sky and smushes the ninja before lifting away again. The fog begins to evaporate completely with its caster destroyed, and before Naruto and Sakura can flee in terror, Minato and several Anbu appear. One Anbu immediately guides Naruto and Sakura to the other side of the wall they passed over initially. Both wonder what's happening, and as they try to peek over the wall's edge, Ino and Shikamaru are brought over by another Anbu. They're unharmed, and the Anbu tells Naruto and Sakura not to peek into the Hokage's business. Sakura tries to tell him that they can tell him what they saw and heard, but the Anbu vanishes without hearing them out. Not long after, Sasuke and Hinata are brought over, leaving the group wondering who invited Sasuke. It's another 10 minutes before Tenten and Shino are brought over by Minato himself. Shikamaru sighs with relief that Choji got them help. Minato tells Shikamaru that he was alerted by his Anbu. No one from the Akamichi clan warned him about this. Shikamaru's smile fades to a frown at the news, and he wonders how they can properly help Choji if he couldn't even tell his dad what happened. Tenten apologizes profusely to everyone. She just wanted to show off her new swords. How many genin are given such famous swords after all? Minato glances at her for a moment, a moment that she catches. Regretfully, she adds that she's just hanging on to them until a Jonin or Anbu decide they want the swords. If she's lucky and no one wants them, she's free to keep them, but they're technically not hers yet. Shino was adversely affected by the smoke, so some immediate first aid was rendered to him, and that's why it took so long for them to come back. Minato tells them all to go home for the day, and to not travel beyond these walls anymore. He's smiling kindly at them, but his tone is stern. After the Genin are out of earshot, Minato turns to his nearest Anbu and tells them to summon the Sanin. The land of water has become bold, Minato whispers ominously, as he tosses his kunai into the air, he might have to get involved in this war personally. Number 12, Rock Lee. I think this one speaks for itself. The sheer inability to use genjutsu and ninjutsu would basically force them to create a special curriculum just for Lee. He doesn't come from a known clan, so he doesn't have any Hiden or Keke Genkai to speak of. 
He's also not the smartest character, or even I would argue in the top half of the Konoha 12. As true now as it was when he first became a Genin is that Rock Lee is clearly the best at Taijutsu of his fellow Genin. Let's then talk about my thoughts on the character himself. As I understand it, all humans have chakra, but normal citizens can't access it or at least don't care to learn how to. And those who become ninja are generally predisposed for it because they can easily access their chakra. So a character like Rock Lee definitely has chakra, he just can't seem to access it. From a creative perspective, it's a tremendous gift to have a gimped character like Rock Lee, because it opens up the possibility for a major breakthrough at some point where he unlocks access to his chakra. This would elevate him to one of the strongest of his group, because then he'd be able to get good with ninjutsu and genjutsu while still being the best at taijutsu. However, I'm not breaking from the mold for Rock Lee. He will remain the taijutsu master we all know and love from canon. This is just a note of curiosity why Kishimoto chose to never take that route with him. While he can't access this chakra consciously, he can still open the inner gates in canon, which increases your chakra output. There's this leap of logic that Kishimoto never directly addresses that explains why the inner gates is so effective for Lee. If Lee can't access his chakra, then increasing the amount he has shouldn't affect him physically, right? So my outlook on this character is not that he has little chakra, just that he can't access it, as if his chakra control were graded as a 0% fail grade. And he's only ranked 12 because of these shortcomings that he can't control. Number 11, Shikamaru. Yep, it's going to get controversial. I'm trying not to rank these characters based on personal feelings, but rather how I assume they treated school life. Just as in canon, Shikamaru wasn't a tryhard at all at the academy. He did the minimum possible effort to get passing grades. But Shikamaru's so smart that he could do these tests with his eyes closed. He never picked up medical ninjutsu because it was sort of optional and required much more initial effort than conventional ninjutsu. Because he slacked off wherever he could, he wasn't in the ideal physical shape either. Neglecting his body has resulted in a smaller starting chakra pool. This is something that has naturally grown as he's done missions and has been forced to actually try. So though his grades were less than expected, I'm sure he exhibited concise decision making in training exercises and practical tests. And though we only ever see him use his hiden technique in canon, he's quite naturally gifted with ninjutsu. He tries to reserve his limited chakra for shadow possession instead of using it on less specialized techniques. Additionally, as I discussed a few videos ago, my rewrite has a unique conditional chakra nature called Shadow. While the Nara clan's shadow possession jutsu utilizes this chakra nature to work. So Shikamaru has a natural inborn edge with one of the most challenging chakra natures to master. And because he was used to just gliding by in the academy, it really put a strain on him to have a team that wasn't cohesive. So his challenges since becoming Genin haven't been training a new technique or self-improvement. Instead, he's been mentally drained by the conflict between Sasuke and Neji, and that's disrupted his focus. Because he was hiding his potential in the academy, his perceived growth to leaders of the village might seem drastic. However, to our eyes, because we know how smart he is, that growth won't feel as drastic. Shikamaru is a sleeper, and we haven't seen him wake up yet. Number 10. Ten Ten. Tenten's most drastic difference in my rewrite is that she actually has lines in a personality. No, no, what I meant to say is that she was with a Taijutsu specialized team in canon. In my rewrite, though she's very much along that Kenjutsu and Taijutsu vein, I wanted to give her connection to some chakra nature as you've already seen. And in order for her to be even halfway effective with that, she needs to not have a small chakra pool. However, Tenten has terrible chakra control. One of her only lines in canon was in a flashback when she told Mike Guy that she dreams of being as strong as the legendary Sanin Tsunade. So she got pretty soul-crushing news in the academy when she learned she lacked the chakra control to use medical ninjutsu. But as that's not the only part of Tsunade's identity, Tenten has switched focus to Kenjutsu and Taijutsu. Before I go further, Kenjutsu is skill in swordplay. Tenten is a general weapons expert, but with these recent swords, I think it's a given that she'll lean more into Kenjutsu. 
but with that horrible chakra control, she can't focus her chakra nature into a point or direction. I tried to demonstrate this when she clashed with Ringo. Her use of lightning was almost aimless, because she wasn't skilled enough to direct it. And her chakra control is so bad that she often dumps it all accidentally instead of letting it trickle out. She tries very hard, but other than her weapons, wasn't very good at anything in particular. She's always struck me as the sort of character that doesn't grow very much until they find something they love and then they grow a lot. I think in the Ninja Academy she just didn't know where to grow and it hurt her overall potential at first. Number 9, Choji. Being best friends with the laziest guy in town can lead you down a path of also being lazy. Choji has very flexible chakra reserves, he's strong and durable, and he's pretty well rounded. But prior to Kurenai trying to broaden his horizons, he just had a minor ability with his expansion jutsu. Because he's a gentle soul, it was very easy for him to pick up medical ninjutsu. That need to help others allowed him to care about learning the skill. However, just as in actual medicine, medical ninjutsu has a very high skill ceiling. Choji isn't cut out for the specialization. He's also a character with tremendous potential for growth if only he finds the confidence to do so. I feel like he was pretty good on practical exams and lackluster in written exams. I don't want to claim that Shikamaru dragged him down because that paints Shikamaru as the bad guy. It's just a symptom of trying to be like your friends in school, something that most of us were a victim of at some point in our lives. If Choji had been focusing, I would have ranked him higher. He's one of my favorite characters, but like I said, I'm not going to rank him higher just because I like him. Choji's not very confident, and though he initially showed a lot of effort to contribute, that visage was shattered recently. Number 8. Hinata Hinata has problems. She's plenty smart, and her confidence is about the height of a toothpick. And this has affected her through all her life's ventures. She's grown up in a household that expects great things of her, only to end up disappointed. Whether it's her father in canon, or uncle in my rewrite, the same expectation is there. She's a disenfranchised heir to an extremely prestigious house. Her cousin is leaps and bounds better than her in their birthright dojutsu. However, on that topic, the Byakugan allows many things. Along with Neji, she was the first in their class to discover their first chakra nature. Speaking of which, hers is fire, which I don't think I've shown so far in the rewrite, but it'll show up later. The Byakugan also grants an advantage with medical ninjutsu in a huge variety of ways. So Hinata was also able to become proficient with this through her time in the academy. And due to the gentle fist she was required to learn outside of school, she has skill with taijutsu as well. After all, just knowing the technique isn't enough if the opponent is faster or more agile. You have to make a connection with your strikes. I guess I would describe her beginning skills as lacking in the basics but having seeds in more complex skills. Similar to Choji, if Hinata found her confidence, her growth would be substantial. Unless that happens, we're dealing with the typical shy girl who weirdly hides behind trees or walls instead of socializing like a normal human being. Number 7, Naruto. Naruto obviously has obscene chakra reserves, but his chakra control isn't where it could be. And while he is a dummy, he does have that fighting intuition that allows him to make snap judgments. He's horrible in genjutsu, but his taijutsu and ninjutsu are pretty good. However, he never tried with medical ninjutsu, so he's totally unable to use it. Clearly, with the Ninetales and his familial heritage, Naruto has substantial growth waiting for him, but it's simply something he hasn't utilized yet. He never really tried in school because of all the prejudice he faced. His teachers weren't necessarily mean to him, but he was always chosen last unless the Hokage was visiting the school. Naruto has been forced into this life of duality, where people on the outside hate him and people on the inside love him, and he adapts his personality to the circumstances. He's not a jerk to his dad, or generally in the presence of his dad, but the second he's separated and among others, he becomes hard to work with. He also has still living relatives, unlike in canon. Remember, the Uzumaki clan in my rewrite lives. They're just nomadic and never stay in one spot very long. Knowing that there are others who share his blood must surely give him hope. He's also had a prodigy like Sasuke constantly come into his home to have secret meetings with his dad. 
but surrounded by ultra-skilled individuals, he's also come to expect great things of himself, only to falter. Between the Sanin, his dad, and Sasuke, he struggles with meeting an internal expectation. Like I said, he has the potential to do all of this, he just needs to realize that himself. Number 6. Kiba Kiba is one of the most confident of the Konoha 12. This carried him through the academy. He is about as dumb as Naruto, but he's got taijutsu and ninjutsu skills in spades. He's strong and fast, and has the energy to fight over a long period. Again, similarly to Naruto, due to his confidence and wealthy chakra reserves, Kiba's potential growth is vast. Kiba's never had any shortcomings about himself, so his ability to adapt and grow is nearly unparalleled. However, this confidence is a double-edged blade. As much as it helps him with his astounding potential, it also constantly makes him underestimate foes. Even against Sasuke, who he ranked lower than, Kiba didn't use hollow words when he challenged him. Kiba 100% thought he could beat Sasuke, and easily, and this kind of thinking got him beat. Also, with Akamaru at his side, I thought summoning the ninja dogs was a no-brainer, but again, a weird choice Kishimoto opted not to do. He wouldn't necessarily need them for tracking, since he has that down himself. Using them in the space of combat could yield some fun results too. Number 5. Shino Shino for me is like a non-lazy version of Shikamaru. He's deliberate and very smart. His skill with ninjutsu is very strong, and though he's pretty capable with taijutsu in canon, that never made sense to me. His body is home to thousands of bugs. Would it not be more delicate and prone to injury than the average person? That's why I've changed his ability to be a little bit weaker in taijutsu. While he is primarily a sensor-type ninja, his bugs have growing versatility that will begin aiding him in so many different ways. Though I would never argue he's as smart as Shikamaru, He's definitely in the top three in terms of intelligence. He was able to perform medical ninjutsu in the academy, but never took a liking to it and let the skill drop off. A good strength of Shino and Kiba in canon is that temperamentally the two are exact opposites. Kiba's wild and crazy while Shino tends to prefer observing from a distance before taking action. And that's a truth that remains in my rewrite, despite the two now being on different teams. I would argue that Shino probably doesn't have a large chakra reserve, but he most definitely has very good chakra control. From a writing perspective, Shino's probably the easiest to write for, despite that I haven't done a whole lot yet with him. He's the easiest to write for because the versatility of his bugs basically give him limitless potential. He might never conjure a meteor, but he can potentially do everything in between. Number 4, Ino. Again, I understand this might be a controversial choice. My takeaway from Ino in canon was that she just overflowed with confidence and seemed smart enough to never have to try with written exams. Even through the story in canon, nothing seemed able to dampen her mood. She always seemed fired up, if not slightly exasperated by her team. So maybe this mindset has tricked me into thinking she's better than she is. However, her mind transfer jutsu is simultaneously the strongest and the weakest of all the Hiden techniques. She does fall unconscious, but she fully possesses someone. In order to possess someone, I think that's a very draining trick. So versus canon, I'd argue my Eno has more chakra reserves and definitely very good chakra control. Just as in canon, she's also able to use medical ninjutsu, and she's quite good with it. Despite being a Hiden technique, I'm not sure if it would classify as Genjutsu or Ninjutsu, since it so overtly affects the opponent's mind as to effectively take full control of it. For the sake of my rewrite, it is a Genjutsu type ability. Her initial chakra nature is water, which of course we learned about when Guy tried to make her manifest water in the desert. I think it's harmless to reveal their chakra natures, as they're all the same as canon. Only characters like Tenten, who in canon didn't have a listed chakra nature are instances where I made up their chakra nature. Number 3, Sakura. In a controlled environment like training exercises, Sakura excelled. Of course she's the smartest character besides Shikamaru, making the classroom setting extremely ideal for her. So her score is only so high because she was in an ideal environment. 
She also showed exceptional promise with medical ninjutsu and retains an advanced skill level with it. Though she didn't take to genjutsu as strongly as she did after becoming a genin, she was always rated as a genjutsu type throughout school. If I had to rank her weaknesses through school, then probably taijutsu. And with no discernible specialization, it's possible her potential for growth left something to the imagination. Regardless, I just want to stress, Sakura is only number three because school was her favorite place to be. She excelled at everything in what was expected of her. For potential in the future, she's obviously rocking the genjutsu hard. With her medical ninjutsu, she still has a lot of diverse growth she can have. Just as in canon, she has all the basics memorized and mastered. It's breaking out from that soft ceiling that she'll need to do to continue to be taken seriously. Number 2. Sasuke. Oh boy. Throughout all of canon, Sasuke is constantly said to be just as much of a prodigy as Itachi, except with keener eyes. But even though it's said, it's never shown. Sasuke, as a fresh genin in canon, is nowhere near where Itachi was. So that statement's always confused me. In my rewrite, him and Itachi are different. Itachi is no longer around for him or anyone else to compare. But I will say that while he was alive, Itachi was certainly a completely different level than Sasuke. However, Sasuke still has the potential to outgrow his brother's accomplishments. While Neji was the first kid in the academy to learn his first chakra nature, Sasuke was the first in the academy's history to discover two of his chakra natures before graduating. And he is, of course, fire and lightning. Of course, most Uchiha have an innate affinity with fire, but as soon as Sasuke learned lightning, he quickly started working with it. He was so quick to pick up skills considered advanced for academy students that he quickly outgrew the academy's curriculum. Sasuke doesn't just have an enormous potential, but he also has enormous expectations considering the vastly weaker state his clan is currently in. Of course, his Sharingan boosts reaction speeds, which help with Taijutsu and Ninjutsu, and its potential to copy any normal Jutsu leaves the opportunity for deception, for advanced combat tactics, and as a strict intimidation factor. It hasn't been since Itachi that the village has had a strong Uchiha scaring the bad guys away. Number 1. Neji. We've finally gotten to the kid that ranked the best in school. Neji has been extremely perceptive from an age so young it preceded school. At no point in the academy did he ever face loss against fellow students. He was number one in everything. In terms of potential and promise, Neji is more often than the other genin compared to Minato's genius from a young age. Of course, in my writing I've mostly focused on his conflicts with Sasuke, but for a genin, Neji can stand on his own two legs. He does not seek the approval of others, and he does not need to. Perhaps his greatest weakness is that Neji is not humble. He knows he's better than you and won't hesitate to illustrate it. But he doesn't have a stick up his butt in the same way Canon Neji did. Canon Neji was extremely antagonistic and oddly entitled. Rewrite Neji is exactly aware of how good he is, and that comes off as being a bit of a jerk to others. If you know the Big Bang Theory TV show at all, I'd compare his ability to someone like Sheldon Cooper. He knows he's the best, and sometimes he's going to insult you. But he's not trying to make you angry, he's just stating fact. This, coupled with his automatic and extreme rivalry with Sasuke, and he hasn't come off as the nicest guy yet. His chakra natures are fire, earth, and water. Because though Sasuke was the youngest to discover two elements in the academy, Neji was the youngest to discover three. He's also the youngest Hyuga in known history to learn three so early. Also, I wanted to talk about chakra some more, because apparently that's my favorite topic. I want all the Genin's chakra natures to play important roles in their ability development. If we're going to call Sakura a Genjutsu type, then she's going to do a lot of Genjutsu. But if she's also a water nature, then she needs to have something that reflects that. I think it vastly impacts the depth of these characters. I've said it before, but canon makes all the characters into one-trick ponies, and I think that's needlessly crippling. This is also a reminder that the Hyuga House puts strong emphasis on chakra natures. Through Gentle Fist, one can choose to close a chakra point or absorb the opponent's chakra nature. This allows the user to adapt, manipulate, and eventually develop that element as a natural occurrence in their own body. This is obviously a rewrite-specific trick. The Byakugan can see the various colors of chakra natures 
and through gentle fist, a Hyuga can eventually attain all the chakra natures. That is, in fact, a very big part of any Hyuga's growth. And, though this should be the end of the episode, I'm going to transition now into a mini-sode focused on a few more Genin in training on the precipice before the Chunin exams. Kiba is begging Guy's ninja tortoise Ningame to allow him to sign a contract. Ningame is disgusted at the idea that other tortoises would be fighting alongside mutts. Kiba says that he has so many ideas for combined jutsus, like what he can do with Akamaru, and again, the tortoise flatly denies him. Meanwhile, Rock Lee's been training more fiercely than he has in his entire life, which is saying something. He's graduated to heavier weights on his legs, and he's decided to keep training until he just can't. Guy tells Lee to rest, but he refuses as he punches a log for the 800th time. He needs to be just as good with Taijutsu as everyone else is with all of their abilities combined. At this point, Lee's been awake for nearly 36 hours and training for most of that time. He's in shambles. Ino has mastered the art of possessing animals, and now Guy has her rapidly swapping between targets. She possesses a bird, and in seconds relinquishes it, and then possesses a nearby rabbit in the cage, and then relinquishes that. One mind transfer is disorienting enough and draining, but Guy has slowly augmented her stamina through this crazy training. He tells her that one day she'll be able to run around while casting the jutsu, and she again scoffs that it's impossible. She tries to reiterate that her mind enters the opponent. How can her body run around when the controller is unmanned? Guy smiles at her and says, where there's a will, there's a way. Eno is just exasperated for the nth time at Guy's perspective of how techniques can improve. Reluctantly sparring with an exhausted Rock Lee, Guy sees the young Genin's legs shaking, and there's no power in his strikes. Finally, he drops the goofy attitude and tells Lee to stop. This level of exhaustion could hospitalize him. Lee refuses and starts complaining that their only big mission was a failure and he couldn't do anything versus their ambushers. He further complains that when he tried fighting with Neji, a fellow Genin, the gap in their skill was so substantial that he couldn't even lay a hand on him. Everything that Lee has been doing since miraculously graduating, since they made concessions for his glaring weaknesses, has led to failure. Whether he's a nobody kid, or a Genin with just D-rank missions under his belt, Lee is furious that he hasn't accomplished anything. They couldn't even run fast enough to help solve the border dispute. Just as in the classroom, Lee's just lagging behind everyone else. Guy tells him that he's accomplished so much despite his shortcomings. Lee has nothing to be ashamed of. He places a hand on Lee's shoulder to soothe him, but Lee smacks it away and refuses the sympathy. Guy knows that along with the physical exhaustion, Lee is also mentally exhausted, explaining his complete lack of patience at the moment. Guy tells him if he wants to take part in the tuning exams, he needs to be in top condition. But where he's going, he'll be hospitalized during the exams. Lee dismisses the warning, yelling now that he can still train for many hours. He turns and strikes the stump again and creates a fist-shaped crater in its side. Guy's shocked. Lee was barely able to touch Guy, let alone make impact with the strikes. Is this Lee's second win? No, that's not what's happened at all. Lee just accidentally unlocked the first gate. Through sheer force of will and anger, Lee has opened one of the eight inner gates. Guy is now stunned. Kiba and Ino both notice a radiating energy coming from Lee as he continues pushing and Guy watches firsthand as the second gate opens. When next he punches the stump, its whole top half rips off. Instead of shutting down Lee before he hurts himself, Guy uses the moment to help Lee remember how he feels right now so he can do this later. Guy's never heard of someone unlocking the gates just from desperation and being completely ignorant of its machinations. Kiba's excited by the show of power and asks Guy if he can learn it too. Guy tells him it's a forbidden jutsu. He shouldn't by all rights teach any of them how to utilize the gates. But if he's going to be training Lee on how to control it, he may as well train Kiba, right? The first and second gates aren't that harmful. It should be okay. Ino is also interested, though maybe not as much as Kiba is. Ningame tells Kiba if he can learn how to open the first gate, 
then maybe he'd be worth signing a contract with. He also tells Kiba that even though Lee just did it accidentally, the eight inner gates are some of the most difficult techniques to learn. He notes that Lee might just be a genius for such a feat. The tortoises can put their differences aside with the dogs as long as Kiba can prove himself strong enough to represent two ninja animals. This puts the fire in Kiba's eyes, and he begs Sky to show him. Meanwhile, Lee collapses from the inhuman exertion he just did. We get to see Kurenai training her team. Shino comes to training after talking with one of the elite Jonin of his family and realizing the effect certain bugs can be augmented to achieve. So he's taken in a queen bee off the direction of his elder and helped by the advice of Kurenai. The collection of pollen and creation of chakra honey would give him longevity in a fight. Not to mention the sheer offensive power of bees in general. But he has to spend time infusing his own chakra with them, as well as learning to guide them from A to B. Bees aren't as good at tracking as they are with remembering routes. So he has a sort of reverse tracking system that he can also potentially use. Choji's still got concerned eyes on him, but in the realm of a safe training environment, he doesn't struggle. From Sakura's help, he's gotten a much better grasp of basic genjutsu, and likes the idea of firing off ghost fireballs in tandem with real ninjutsu. So he spends his time practicing this. Sakura has learned more about how sound incorporates into an illusion. Once she's weaved the illusion, she learns that she can clap to cause the visual aspect of the genjutsu to twist and mutate. Kurunai notes that it adds a nauseating effect. She also notes that she was never this creative with Genjutsu when she was learning how to use it. Never mind learning and mastering the style, Sakura is naturally inventing unique ways of enhancing the effect for different results. The Genin have all been forbidden from asking about what happened with the Mist Ninja and that weird spiked thing that clobbered him. But Sakura and Naruto saw it happen firsthand. So Sakura has been given a talking to several times when she just can't restrain herself from asking about it. She knows the fourth Hokage showed up immediately and the threat was probably addressed immediately, but it's still a spooky series of events. Lastly, we settle on Asuma and he's dismissed his Genin for the day, insisting that they need as much rest as they can get for the Chunin exams tomorrow. But he's held Naruto back. He asks if he can see Naruto's Raijin blade for a moment, and when Naruto gives it to him, Asuma inspects its craftsmanship before pocketing it. Naruto calls him out on taking the kunai, but Asuma tells him that all he's done with his father's gift is run away. In the Chunin exams, if he wants to do well, he needs to not run away. Naruto grumbles and says he never runs away for good, just to formulate strategy. Asuma chuckles and sarcastically agrees with him. Asuma tells Naruto that of all the genin, he's easily got the most chakra, and that's forgetting the fox. He tells him that he wants to see Naruto actually try. Naruto's not taking the exams to show off or impress his peers or even his dad. The only person who benefits from Naruto's performance is Naruto. He needs his team to get through it, but he needs himself to stand out. If the only trick in his book is to teleport into a tree and hide, all he'll do is disappoint those judging him. He tells Naruto that he'll get the kunai back after the exams. Naruto asks him why he didn't train him in anything else then. Asuma reminds him about the Windblade Jutsu he's been working on. If he perfects that, then he won't need to rely on the Flying Raijin. Naruto raises an eyebrow at Asuma, insisting that Asuma understands how insane the Flying Raijin is. Asuma remarks that the Flying Raijin, by itself, is only defensive, and Naruto can't win any matches with just that. Without the kunai at his fingertips, Naruto will be forced to rely on everything else he knows how to do.